Margaret Atwood, what a thrill. Just landed from Canada, which is perhaps not better, but bigger than most countries. It's Isn't very, it very big. It's really big. <laughs> There's a song about that. Yes, it's called Canada's Really Big. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can sing it later on. Well, you can find it on YouTube. Okay, and, uh, that's, that's what we'll do. Yes. I have been living in a different country from any country I know, and yet I know it, because I've been reading all three books that have ended up with Mad Adam. And that is one crazy world, uh, but in three books, and you should definitely read them all. Uh, maybe you already have at least the two of them. So this is Mad Adam from 2013, and you've been touring with this, but the whole project started a long time ago. The whole project started a long time ago. <laughs> Do the little voice. <laughs> yes, the, the whole project started a long time ago. <laughs> Dear. Uh, <laughs> once upon a time. I know, yes, fairy so, tales. Yes, so I was looking back at a book called Cat's Eye that I published in 1988, but it contains reportage from the mid-1950s. In fact, there is a male parent in it uh, who is a biologist and who is saying in chapter 40 uh, practically the whole plot of the backstory of Mad Adam. So species extinction, global warming, methane burping cows, uh, the, whole, the whole scenario uh, was known as, as back then, uh, and uh, nobody did anything. So here we are now. And again, in 1972, the Club of Rome published a report about the state of the planet, making uh, predictions um, as to what would happen if we kept on the path that we were on then. And again, nobody did anything. So, so now we have Mad Adam. <laughs> And at least as a book. Doing anything. Yes. At least as a book. Yes, at least as a book, but there are two kinds of roughly considered science fiction. And you can call them science fiction one and science fiction two, or you could call them science fiction and speculative fiction. But they are different in in nature, by which I mean science fiction one takes place in a galaxy far, far away and in a different time and you're never going to go there. And if you want to cross-breed that with fantasy, you can have dragons as well. You don't do dragons. On Planet X. Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm not good at it. And the person who is good at it has already done the best dragon, so forget it. Forget <laughs> the dragons, and that would be Ursula K. Le Guin. Best dragons. Um, first prize dragons. <laughs> <laughs> you do do yes. a kind of princesses, though. There are a few princesses in Mad Adam. <laughs> I mean, uh, kind of adorable women. Oh, that's different. Yes, well. when, I, when I think princess, I do think, unfortunately, the pink sparkles and the little crown. Uh, so there aren't any of those. So... Science fiction 2, or speculative fiction, takes place on this planet, and it's well within uh, possibility. So that would be 1984, Brave New World. And that's the only kind I can write, although I read the other kind. I'm not good at it, so I try not to do it, except in very small bursts. <laughs> uh, but Mad Adam, we could do it all, and since I published the first book, Oryx and Crake, we have done some of the things that were only proposed in it, but have now come true. So that And you is don't do prophecies, you just write novels? Prophecy is not really possible, simply because there is not one predetermined future. There are an infinite number of possibilities, and there are a lot of uh, unexpected turn of events, turns of event that may happen, but that we haven't even thought about. 
For instance, we almost annihilated the human race during the Vietnam War. Did you know that? No. No, nobody did, uh, <laughs> including me. I just found out about it, and it wasn't nuclear bombs. It was Agent Orange, which the West was transporting across the Pacific Ocean in huge vats. If any of those vats had come open, if there had been an accident and they had opened up and that extremely potent plant killer had gotten into the ocean and killed the marine algae, we would have stopped effectively breathing because it is that marine algae that still produces 60 to 80 percent of the oxygen that we breathe. We always think Amazon mm. rainforest, but the, the big producer is still the marine algae. So who knew that? Not me. Now we know. Yes, well, it didn't happen then. No. But that's why we have to be very aware of the ocean, which, of course, you are, because you it's live all, in Denmark. It's all around it's us. It's all around us. It's and wonderful. It's, and it's getting bigger. <laughs> like Canada. <laughs> <laughs> just to get, Just to get the notion of uh, Mad Adam and the way people are, at least some of them. I would like you to read a small piece, if you would be so kind. I would be very kind, but I would first require my spectacles. Yeah, I know. I put mine on because I'm not so vain. First I need my <laughs> spectacles, dear. <laughs> and then you'll make the spectacle. Well, what kind of spectacles are yours, anyway? Are they trifocals? They can, they can do, you know, reading and... I see well, you clearly. Mine are just plain old reading glasses. Yeah, okay. So I'm denying. I, I see your vanity, and I raise you one. <laughs> okay. This so, is it. Yes, yeah, so this is one of the narrators who is called um, Toby. And she is, um, finds herself post um, Ebola, Mar Marburg, human race eradicator, plague, um, airborne. She finds herself after that event in the world with a, uh, a group of genetically uh, modified human beings which, who have been designed to avoid all of the things in our nature that get us into so much trouble. So they're not aggressive. Not only are they vegetarian, but they can eat leaves like rabbits. There are some side effects to that, but we won't go into <laughs> them. The rabbit thing, you mean? The rabbit thing, yeah. yes. <laughs> Anybody who has kept rabbits will know what those things are, but they, they have to do it. Um, you can ask during question period what that is. So, and they also have built-in sunblock and insect repellent, which I think would be good things. And therefore, they will never get skin cancer. Wouldn't that be nice? And they, best of all, will never have um, romantic agony or, or jealousy or feel rejected because like other mammals, but unlike human beings, they mate seasonally mm -hmm. and they give clear visible signals as to when that event will take place. Can you just say There's what no the confusion. signals are? Um, parts of them turn blue. <laughs> Huge as parts of them. As with some of the primates. Yes, pleasingly large parts of them turn <laughs> blue. <laughs> How they're going to do that in the TV series, I don't know. But <laughs> that will be a problem that they will have to solve. Both the balloonists, never mind. Um, so they also, um, because their designer didn't have a lot of patience with small children, they, they get older faster than, than ours do. <laughs> Yes, he put a lot of features in that he would have liked to have himself. Um, they're all very good looking. And uh, plus the blue thing, I mean, people would kill for that. Uh, so <laughs> to the excerpt, you want me to read to where? From that, here and that, that's quite a lot. All right. There. 
She wakes to find a small Quaker boy in the room with her. He's lifted the edge of the damp sheet that entwists her and is gently stroking her leg. He smells of oranges and of something else, citrus air freshener. They all smell like this, but the young ones more. What are you doing, she asks, as calmly as she can. My toenails are so dirty, she thinks, dirty and jagged. Nail scissors, put them on the gleaning list. Her skin is coarse beside the pristine skin on the hand of this child. Is he glowing from within, or is his skin so fine-grained it reflects the light? Oh, Toby, you have legs underneath, says the boy, like us. These people don't wear clothes, because think of all the commerce and aggression involved in clothing. You have legs underneath, says the boy, like us. Yes, she says, I do. Do you have breasts, O oh, Toby? Yes, I have those as well, she says, smiling. Are there two? <laughs> two breasts? Yes, she says, resisting to her, er, the urge to add, so far. <laughs> Is he expecting one breast or three or maybe four or six like a dog? Has he ever seen a dog up close? Will a baby come out from between your legs, O oh, Toby, after you turn blue? <laughs> what is he asking? Whether non-Craker people like her can have babies or whether she herself might have one. If I were younger, then a baby might come out, she says, but not now. Though her age isn't the deciding factor, if her whole life had been different, if she hadn't needed the money, if she'd lived in another universe. Oh, Toby, says the Quaker boy, what sickness do you have? Are you hurt? He puts up his beautiful arms to hug her. Are those tears in his strange green eyes? It's all right, she says. I'm not hurt anymore. She'd sold some of her eggs to pay the rent back in her plebe land days before the God's gardeners her take, had taken her in. There'd been infection all her future children precluded. Surely she'd buried that particular sadness many years ago. If not, she ought to bury it in view of the total situation, the situation of what used to be thought of as the human race. Such emotions ought to be dismissed as meaningless. She's about to add, I have scars inside me, but she stops herself. What is a scar, O oh Toby? That would be the next question. Then she'd have to explain what a scar is. A scar is like writing on your body. It tells about something that once happened to you, such as a cut on your skin where blood came out. What is writing, O oh Toby? <laughs> writing is when you make marks on a piece of paper, on a stone, on a, on a flat surface, like the sand on the beach, and each of the marks means a sound, and the sounds Joined together mean a word, and the words joined together mean, how do you make this writing, O oh, Toby? You make it with a keyboard. Oh, no, no, no. Um, once you made it with a pen or a pencil. A pencil is, or you make it with a stick. Oh, Toby, I do not understand. You make a mark with a stick on your skin. You cut your skin open, and then it is a scar, and that scar turns into a voice. <laughs> it speaks. It tells us things. Oh, Toby, can we hear what the scar says? Show us how to make the scars that talk. No, she should stay away from the whole scar business. Otherwise, she might inspire the Quakers to start carving themselves up to see if they can let out the voices. What's your name, she says to the little boy. My name is Blackbeard, says the child gravely. I chose this part because in part it's very funny, and in part because you get to know the Quakers, who are indeed uh, a new human race, very much from scratch. 
uh, oh, Margaret Atwood. It's also because it's about writing, uh, and Blackbeard is eventually one of the storytellers. No spoilers. Of, no spoilers. Okay. <laughs> if that's a spoiler, nobody heard what I just said. <laughs> just you and me. But uh, when you have to make a completely new human race as a writer, and you think about the smart trick with the sun repellent and uh, the, you know, the insect repellent and the sun block, and then you make up a people who don't know anything. Well, they don't know the things we know. They know other things, as it turns out. Uh, but our kinds of things, such as when we first meet them in uh, Oryx and Crake, their designer, Crake, has tried to make them, he tried at first to make them devoid of symbolic thinking because he felt it led to kings and wars and you know flags and all the things he felt were bad religions, uh, but he was unable to make them without symbolic thinking as it turns out. So we find them discovering what is a picture, things like that. There is a, a wonderful um, image in the uh, Parker Library at, at Cambridge University in England, England, which is the first flat image that we know of in Europe on a piece of paper. And it is a picture of an eagle. And un underneath it, it doesn't say eagle. It says, image of an eagle. <laughs> so that you wouldn't think that this really was an eagle. It's smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, pointing out, this is, the, by the way, this isn't really an eagle. It's an image of an mm. eagle. So that idea that something can be a picture of something else, but it's not the real thing, um, that all had to be explained. Uh, but by the end of that book, the Oryx and Craig, the first book, they're, they're making a, a statue. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> they can't help it. They are human in some sense. Well, you can't apparently um, do away with symbolic thinking and have something that would still be a recognizable human being. But this also is a, a, a scene like a scene between a mother and a child. You have to explain uh, everything. Everything. Yes. Well, you on. have to explain. Uh, yes, you do. In fact, beginning when they start uh, talking, because then they can ask questions. It's not that they didn't have questions before; they couldn't express the questions before. So, around if you've ever been around small children a lot, you know <laughs> that around uh, two and a half, they're going to be saying, "What's that?" Mm. quite a bit. Yeah. And also why? And also no. <laughs> <laughs> in in this uh, Mad Adam, there are so many, or the whole trilogy, there are so many words and things made up by you that made. <laughs> Why do you look so, uh, I had to, <laughs> there are actually, it's, it's like, it's kind of like an alphabet, even. Uh, oh, with the, the names of things, you mean yeah. like brand names? Yes, for okay, instance. Okay, I'll tell you why I have to make up brand names. You have to make up brand names so that you're not referring to an actual brand that really exists. Because if you do, the proprietors of that brand could get very, could get very crabby. <laughs> For instance, um, in Oryx and Crake, there's an online television live streamed uh, show called nightynight.com. And nightynight.com is a stage assisted suicide show in which you get to plan your own suicide and stage it with singings and dancings and, you know, stage sets and a. How an you want MC. to go? Well, you know, a nice production. And it's called nightynight.com, but when I looked up nightynight.com, because I had to research all of these, it turned out to be a children's sleepwear company. <laughs> so they, they would have been quite cross if I'd spelled it the way that they do. So I had to change the spelling. Hmm. There's a, a spa where Toby 
uh, hides out during the plague, I think a spa would be a very good place to do that. This is quite a nice spa. It's got pink towels and the organic lettuce that's grown in the little kitchen garden. And it's called A New You. <laughs> so, but there are things but pretty close to that. I had to change the spelling because there are several places called A New You, as you might imagine. Yeah. And the other one, it's a, it's a high-end uh, sex club called Scales and Tails. Uh, <laughs> they have a good dental plan. Uh, so in the future, all of this is, of course, controlled by corporations. So, that, so anyway, so... And it turns out there are several places called Scales and Tails. They happen to be pet shops, but they exist. I'm trying to also talk a little about this uh, the process, process of writing because there are two very important men in, in this story, Adam One and Zepp, which and, and between them are so many differences that it's like an alphabet from A to Zepp. <laughs> I was thinking if that was on purpose. From Well, their male parent did that on purpose. Yeah. One beginning with A, one beginning with Z. Um, so he is the male parent of both of them, although they have different mothers, so they are half-brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they both uh, come from the same background, but they went quite different ways, although they remain joined at the hip. They're so Adam I became the leader of a very green cult called the God's Gardeners, and we meet them extensively in the second book where they are growing vegetables on rooftops in slums and they have developed their own theology and their own set of saints including for instance Saint Robert Burns of Mice because of the, <laughs> the <laughs> communication with animals um, Saint Al Gore, you can tell that he will be a saint in the future, <laughs> if we if we live that long, and I tried to get saints from all around the world in different areas, uh, so they have those saints, and they also have special days in which they pay homage to different um, groups of species on planet Earth because they're dedicated to um, to the idea of. Uh, species survival. So he's head of that cult and uh, Zeb on the other hand uh, is much more street smart and he he teaches something called urban bloodshed limitation which means that <laughs> you should limit urban bloodshed by making sure it isn't yours but <laughs> instead somebody <Excuse> else's. <laughs> Zeb is, Zeb is uh, he's the hero, I think, of... Uh, He's the hero of Mad Adam. Yeah. Because finally the pacifism of the God's gardeners uh, in face of the uh, kinds of things that the giant corporations are doing in the future, because in the future, I hate to break this to you, governments are relatively ineffectual, <laughs> um, unlike today. And uh, giant corporations have much more power, unlike today and a great deal more money, unlike today, and they also have their own um, private army police force, unlike today, which is, <laughs> which is called the Corpse Corps. Uh, so in face of that, Zeb does not feel that he can maintain the pacifist approach, and he breaks off and starts a group called Mad Adam, uh, or builds out a group called Mad Adam that de dedicates itself to uh, biological resistance because we are in the age in the future unlike today of genetic engineering <laughs> unlike today of, of strange kinds unlike today uh, so they develop such things as for instance microbes that can eat asphalt highways and uh, mice that have a strange attraction to the wiring in your car <laughs> unlike today. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot to work with already with those mice. You just have to tweak them a bit. 
You don't do dragons, but you do pigoons. I do pigoons. And you yes. do raconks. Pigoons already pretty much exist. <laughs> they were working on them in, in 2001 when I started this series, and now they have, in fact, solved the problem of the knockout gene, and they can grow kidneys for human transplant in pigs. They have hand on heart said they are not going to grow human cortex tissue in them. <laughs> Do you believe that? It's such a temptation. If you needed a little bit of a brain transplant, wouldn't you like to be able to grow a bit of your own brain and then have it put in? Would you like that? Of course you I'm would. I'm getting scared here. Of course you would. <laughs> we would all like it. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Guess what they've just done? If I'd known about this, I would have put it in. But they just did it. They've just discovered that if you take an old mouse and put young mouse blood into it, this is bad news for babies, um, it rejuvenates the old mouse. Look out, world. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? It's very interesting. And, and I think, I mean, reading this trilogy, I think it's a bit like... A, opening Pandora's box or jar, but you still have access to a lot of information because you told me earlier on that you have more than 500,000 followers on Twitter. On Twitter, yes, and some and of them are scientists. They, and, they tell me everything. And they tell you all kind of weird yeah. things. But there was no Twitter in 2001. No. No, it hadn't happened yet. So many things hadn't happened yet. And that was just 14 years ago. So the, the uh, growth of this kind of, um, or these kinds of technologies on all fronts is now exponential. But while, I mean, while you are writing books like Year of the Flood, Oryx and Craig and, and Mad Adam, I suppose that you are as much immersed in the, in the creative process of writing as you are in the scientific world or looking up and saying, oh my God, this already happened. I thought I was thinking it up. What, what is it like to be writing this kind of story? Um, I think it's a little bit like running very fast mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you're, you're just a little, you're just about that, you're a split second ahead of, of reality. And reality may not, in fact, take the turn that you might have thought that it would, um, or it may already have taken that turn and you just didn't know about it. Or as William Gibson, the author of Neuromancer, has said, um, the future is already here, but it's unevenly distributed. <laughs> so it's lumpy. But as you said, it's not, it's not science fiction, it's what you call speculative fiction, but it's also... Uh, it's, it's not science fiction one on another planet and no, with dragons. No. But it's also it's something very... I mean, it's also a love story, because uh, Sepp, the hero, Sepp, who gets tired of the pacifist way of uh, solving things, is also the, the secret uh, aim for the love of Toby, who we just heard about before. She's in love with him. And yes. eventually, no spoilers. I don't, how much can I say I'm getting... Well, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> yes, eventually it, it has a, a temporarily happy ending anyway. Yeah. And, and the, it has a good ending. Uh, that's <laughs> and, and the funny well, thing... Well, all happy endings are temporary. Come on. <laughs> you know that. I mean, you've... Uh, I'm sure a lot of your readers here have started with your uh, books many, many years ago, and, and though you're not a feminist writer because you were sort of grabbed by the feminists well, while you if, were writing... Well, by feminist we mean women are human beings. Hands up. I'm all for it. I'll take <laughs> hands up for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then we have to examine what that means, and it does not mean that all women are angels. It no. just doesn't mean that. It doesn't Sorry. mean... No. And, uh, and not only are they not all angels, but I mean, Toby in her love for Seb goes through all kinds of emotions, jealousy and uh, vanity and suspicion, despair. Uh, despair, absolute despair. And I was thinking, so this is the f a kind of a future and nothing really happened. Men and women are all the same. 
You expected something else? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe well, a microbe the, that on would the eat other up hand, the <laughs> On the other hand, the crakers who mate seasonally and turn blue uh, also mate in groups. So they don't have any jealousy. You could do that. Yeah. <laughs> When, also, when we try it, as in hippie communes, it usually doesn't work out tippity top well. <laughs> uh, but some people seem to, to manage it. However, jealousy is a very, very you know, built-in biological thing. If any social animal ever have dogs? Yeah, long okay, time ago. Two dogs? No. No. Well, if you have two, you know. They're jealous of one. They, if one of them gets something, the other one wants it too. If, one, if you're patting one of them, the other will shove in. <laughs> uh, cats will compete for who gets to control the stairs to the second floor. <laughs> <laughs> you know that. I know that. Yeah, so it's not, it's not a specifically human thing. It's, 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 a, it's a biological thing that, that Craig tried to do away with. But, he felt it caused too much trouble. But as you say, that not all women are angels, and not all women in the books are angels, far from it. But no. some of them are rather tough cookies. Um, yes. Toby is one. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good thing. Uh, in, in such a future, and it would help to be a good shot. Yeah. And she... <laughs> And she is a good shot, but she's also a bit uh, too influenced by uh, the, should I call it quasi-religious uh, upbringing with the gardeners. The Adam one influence is, is hard on her when she has to act sometimes. Oh, you're thinking of the moment when she thinks, should I eat part of this dead pig? For instance. For instance, or yes. Or the paintballers that she... Those kinds of things, yeah. yes. Yes, should I kill someone, yeah, even instance. though they, even though they very much deserve it? Yeah. <laughs> She's not very good at that. Not at first. Not at first. <laughs> What she is good at is, she's good at surviving, and uh, several of the, the women are good at surviving, although they are really uh, object to horrible violence in, in your book. Well, you know, all you really have to do is read the newspapers for those kinds of stories. Um, because those kinds of stories are happening in the world around us all over the place right now. And uh, sadly, there are a lot of stories about people who don't, who don't make it through. Uh, but, but this isn't something new either. If you, if you go back in, in human history, as far back as we know, there have been... Uh, awful events, you know, wars specifically, but uh, wars, famines, and and plagues are usually the the big killers, and those have been going on for a very very long time now, and um, thanks to the toughness of some of our very very distant ancestors, we're here today. Mm. There was a moment when the ice ages were quite advanced when the human race was apparently, it went through a bottleneck, a small population, a diminishment to a small population at the bottom of Africa, where it, it, it made it through. So we have uh, societies and our species in particular, we've done this before. Mm. This is also a very small society that's left in, in the as, as far as it knows. Of uh, course, once the communication devices go down, just think, if I take away your phone <laughs> for a whole month, don't let you watch any television, read any newspapers, how will you know what's going on uh, on another continent? You won't. So we know about this small group of people And this, was, this is what the world was like for a very, 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 very long time. It was mm. small groups of people who were aware just of themselves, which is why in, in many tribal languages, their word for themselves means people. And any, anybody coming in from outside is by definition not a person. True. 
this this sounds a bit like the world that you perhaps grew up in. I mean, you grew oh, up. Oh no, in we had. We, yes, we, <laughs> I spent, it wasn't quite like that. Yes, we always spent the winter in cities. Phones exist still. I can I can yes, assure yes, you, nobody the took them away, <laughs> but uh, somebody probably will. No, but I mean, I, I was wondering if part of the uh, the inspiration for. Oh the yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. We spent spring, summer, and fall mm. up in the north of Canada without such communications devices. Yeah. So no phone, no television. Uh, on the radio, we could get Russia uh, <laughs> on the short wave. <laughs> wasn't much use. Um, no theater, no school, no... Um, not a lot of other people. This wasn't a village. It was actually out in the woods. So yes, I'm, I'm familiar with that. And... Uh, the kinds of things that we rely on to get news from one place to another. I'm also old enough so that my mother can remember the first radio broadcast that she ever heard. And I said, what was it? And she said, it was an advertisement for socks. <laughs> <laughs> That's significant. <laughs> <laughs> Already, they heard advertising. And she can remember, of course, when the telephone, when people got telephones. Uh, and my other grandparents didn't have electricity until the early 60s. So I saw a, essentially a Victorian farm in operation before there were electric lights, telephones, any of those things. So you are a survivor. You survived. No, no, I just, I'm just, I'm just old. <laughs> so I didn't well, have that's to. That's a way of survival. Yeah, well, I didn't well. have to go through anything to to do that. It's just the world changed mm. around me. I, I had no hand in in having it do that, but I was able to observe these changes as they came about. And anybody my age who grew up in a rural community anywhere will be quite familiar with those changes as they watching them come in. So what what there was was there were books. Up yeah, up in the woods there were books. Yeah. And that was it. You know, that that was the art form. <laughs> <laughs> so there were books. So of course I was an early reader and it being the forties, we had the funny papers. The funny papers were very big in that um, decade. So, funny papers and books. Nobody ever told me not to read a given book. They probably should have, <laughs> but I, I because just... Because you, you read a lot of different kinds of books. I read everything. <laughs> I just read... Never mind, I won't tell you what I just read. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the books that you've read many times is the Bible. Yes. And the Bible is a big influence in a way, because this is Adam and Eve's, and it's... Well, if you were going to have a new religion based in North America, it's pretty much going to be uh, biblically based. Uh, even if it's a... There is, in fact, a, a green branch of Christianity right, right now, and they have something called the Green Bible. It's got the green parts printed in green. It's on uh, tastefully virtuous paper. It has an introduction by Archbishop Tutu. How much more virtuous can you get? Not much, And I then think. it's got green hints at the back for what you can do to be a better green Christian. And I know a group of these people now. I didn't when I was writing it, but I now know them, as you might expect. <laughs> uh, and they're called Arasha. You can look them up. They are God's gardeners pretty much in practice. Really? They already exist, yeah. <laughs> but they um, didn't so sue you. No, no, they <laughs> love me. They, they, they know that I understand them. <laughs> I've, I've been to visit them. I did a fundraiser for them. Oh, this, this kind of thing needs all the help it can get. So I'm all in favor of them. And of course, the Buddhists and the Hindus never severed their links with their connections with, with nature. And even the Koran has got some pretty nature-friendly things in it. Uh, the Christian world went uh, mechanistic in the 18th century. They started doing ghost in the machine. You know, only we have souls, nothing else does. Animals are just machines, etc. 
Darwin was against that view, by the way. And people are now coming around to a much more holistic view of nature. Um, so it's, it shouldn't be too surprising that Christianity is now connecting with its roots. If you go into any medieval cathedral, what do you see? You see trees, essentially, the pillars. You see all the vines and flowers around the top. And on all the pews, you see little carvings of, of animals and plants. And around the, um, around the walls, you will probably get the creation, the whole story, up to the last judgment. You get the heaven up the top with the stars and things. So essentially, it's a universe. Those medieval churches were visual represent, representations of a universe which included nature big time. But the church that we hear about in Mad Adam is not a, a church that includes animal. It's uh, petroleum. The oh, well, the, badge, the one that Zeb and Adam grow, grow up in. There's a yeah. number of different religions in this world. And uh, one of them is the Petro Baptists, which pretty much <laughs> exist today in Texas. <laughs> Ask anyone. Um, and and the one that his that their father is a, a somewhat corrupt preacher in is called the Church of Peter Oleum, and it is biblically based because what does Peter mean? It means rock, and uh, Jesus famously said, "On this rock will I found this." Uh, well, I found my church, and, and what, does, what does petroleum mean? It means oil coming out of a rock. Makes sense. And what is holy in the Bible? Well, it's oil. That's what you use, use to anoint people with. It's a mm. sign of holiness. So the church of petroleum worships oil. <laughs> Why not? Why <laughs> not? Well... The thing that is most important to you in this life is what you worship. So a lot of people worship oil already. Yeah, they, they just, just don't they know. Just they, they, they just don't know. They haven't formalized no. it, but they will. <laughs> 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 I've done it for them. All they have to do, you know, <laughs> feel free. <laughs> this name isn't trademarked. Set up your church. They haven't popped up like the gods, gardeners, the petroleum. Well, well, they're there in in all but name. The, the thing there, is, there are people who actually believe that it, that it's God's will uh, that you should burn as much carbon as possible because that's hastening the end of the world, a desirable <laughs> thing in their view, because they will be raptured up to heaven and you will fry. Yeah, <laughs> a that, good thing. A I, good I, thing. I, yeah, that's a that's a possible solution. Uh, I think there are so many things to, in these. To what? Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> to taking your car with a good with oh, a good yeah. conscience. Yes. No, I, there there are so many things that that where you are all, almost on the verge of uh, you know what is reality and what is uh, and there is a game in Mad Adam Extinctathon. Extinctathon. Yeah. Yes, it's what what um, Jimmy, the hero of. Uh, Oryx and Crake, and uh, and Crake, the creator of the Crakers, it's a game that they play. Yeah. They also play another game called Blood and Roses, in which you have to tr trade uh, human accomplishments of genius against human atrocities. Yeah. So what is Beethoven's ninth worth? <laughs> in terms of massacres. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a lot, as I recall. <laughs> but, but, but then afterwards, after you published uh, the book, this has actually become a game that somebody uh, didn't, I think I've, I've extinct a thorn, or is it, it has it, it's become, it, it exists as a platform or? Oh, somebody did a, um, a game involving, yeah. Yeah. involving um, germs. Yeah. Yes. In and which you uh, you get to try to eliminate the germs before they um, toast one of your organs. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you have to be quite rapid with the germs. I can't do it. I I only get to level three. 
And then, and then if you fail, a sign comes on saying, you have died. <laughs> it's, That's it's really very, depressing. <laughs> it's, well, it's very encouraging because you get to have an, as many other goes as you wish. So you can come alive again as but, many times as you want. Don't you think that's nice? Even without the blood, even without the young blood infusion. You can even without the blood, yes. They haven't tried this on human beings yet, but it's, it's worrying enough that they're doing it with mice. It's a matter of time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Margaret, why do the Quaker people purr? Why do they purr? All right, so my brother, who is a biologist, uh, he's an older brother. And when I published my first book of poetry, he wrote me an older brother letter, which went, Congratulations on publishing your first book of poetry. I used to do that kind of thing myself <laughs> when I was younger. <laughs> so with Oryx and Craig, he said, I thought you did a pretty good job with the sex, but I'm not so sure about the purring. <laughs> this is from a biological point of view. Of course. However, science has now vindicated my view, and if you look up on the internet migraine headaches purring, you will see that it is now recommended that if you have a migraine headache, you should put a purring cat on your head. No you are kidding this I time. I am not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Swear. Do, try this at home. You know, look it up. I'm telling you the truth. It doesn't tell you how to keep the cat on your head. <laughs> but a little ingenuity can supply that want. I, have, I envisage a kind of large net that you tie under your chin. It's called... The cat in the hat. <laughs> yes, because the people wondered for a long time why cats purred. And they knew it wasn't just because they were happy. Because if you've, if you've ever had cats, which I have, and you know that when you take them to the vet and they're afraid, or when they're in pain, they, they also purr. Hmm. So, and you also know that if you're ill your cat will frequently get up on top of you and purr over the afflicted part. Have you noticed that? No. Maybe you have a particularly ornery cat. You <laughs> uh, can do that. And you will also know that when somebody comes into your house who is afraid of cats, your cat will immediately go over to that person because they're very selfless. And they're going over to that person because they want to help by purring on them. That's a lie. I'm sorry. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, after but they all. are very curious, and it's probably because they, they, uh, an, a fierce, a, a person who is afraid smells differently, so, and, and that's true, to a cat. Which is another ability of the Quakers. They can smell they have how very you are. good sense of smell. Yeah, they really do. So compared to a, some something like a dog, we are we are deaf mute when it comes to smell. We we smell only about that much of the visible of the smellable spectrum of the world. So they have a, an infinitely larger vocabulary of smell than we do. Just as, for instance, um. Um, a raptor, such as an eagle or a hawk, has a fantastically better eyesight than we. Um, so these are things, you know, that other animals have that we don't, but the crakers indeed have a very good sense of smell. It would be useful. There is something amazing about the way that you um, know everything. I don't know everything. No, 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 no. Well, almost everything. No, I don't even know <laughs> And how mm. things come into the books and then things come out from the books and become real things, like this one, for instance. <laughs> yes, the Secret Burgers t-shirt, she has it. So Secret Burgers are a, are a chain, a, a burger chain in this series. And they're called Secret Burgers because nobody really knows what's in them. <laughs> and, <laughs> unlike today. And... Uh, <laughs> 
And their slogan is, secret burgers, because everybody loves it's a secret. It's on the back. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that when you then put this t-shirt on, you have the best of conscience because it's climate neutral. And uh, it's, earth, it's an earth positive t-shirt. Isn't that good? It's beautiful. <laughs> so, you also like to travel around when you, ha when you have to do this thing. You've, you've come by plane. Yes, but against, we, we, against your will. But we, we double carbon offset. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's, I mean, it's, it's difficult to do the right thing always. But well, here's one thing I do know. I don't know everything, but I know this. The cheapest and fastest way uh, to take carbon out of the atmosphere is to regrow tropical rainforests. And uh, I know that because I know somebody who's involved in, in doing that. So that is, that is true. Isn't that good? It's great. That's, <laughs> that's what we'll also do. <laughs> but what we, we, ha we have to round up, uh, unfortunately. Round up is a really uh, <laughs> uh, not a good word. <laughs> How could I? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to end on a literary note, uh, because it's difficult not to get to talk about all the other things, uh, could you read us a poem? Yes. Because you have a large, uh, a large also selection of poetry that you should also read, apart oh. from the novels. And mm -hmm. here, here's one reason why. Now, which one would we like to read today? Well, I suggested the, a, sn a snake poem to... Okay, let's But I don't know what you brought eventually. I brought whatever you told me to bring because I'm a very, very <laughs> dutiful person. <laughs> but where are these things that I was so <laughs> sure that I had brought? <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to bring the book, but the poem was on you. <laughs> the poem was on me. Okay, so the first thing is the glasses. We'll find them first. Now we will find pieces of paper. Because you're fond of snakes. That's not it. No? Um, well, I grew up with the snakes because... Oh, here we are. My brother was very, very fond of, of snakes as a boy, and... This is north of, north of Canada where there are no venomous snakes, so they weren't dangerous. And as a little boy, he used to uh, catch the snake, snakes and take them into bed with him. And then they would get out during the night and they would go into the warm ashes of the wood stove because they like warmth. So my mother, when she would come to light the fire in the morning, would have this ashes-covered snake coming up <laughs> So she had to have a chat, and the chat was, snakes are happier outside. <laughs> <laughs> because it is their home. So I did um, grow up around snakes quite a lot, and I'm not um, afraid of them, or not of those kinds. <laughs> so I'll read Snake Woman. How about that? That's great. And this is when I was at summer camp teaching at summer camp, teaching a nature program at summer camp, teaching a nature program at, at a summer camp attended exclusively by urban children and fellow counselors who were afraid of snakes. <laughs> snake woman. I was once the snake woman, the only person, it seems, in the whole place who wasn't terrified of them. I used to hunt with two sticks among milkweed and under porches and logs for this vein of cool green metal which would run through my fingers like mercury or turn to a raw bracelet gripping my wrist. I could follow them by their odor, a sick smell, acid and glandular, part skunk, part inside of a torn stomach, the smell of their fear. Once caught, I'd carry them limp and terrorized into the dining room, something even men were afraid of. 
What fun I had. <laughs> Put that thing in my bed and I'll kill you. Now, I don't know. Now I'd consider the snake. Mark Rodapin, thank you so much. <laughs> Do we do questions? No, no, no. You have to no, sign no, good. No. Okay.